Every year, hundreds of massive ships, up to 1,000 feet long and weighing more than 40,000 tons of steel, carry out the final voyage of their lives. But instead of docking at Port and Glory, they run straight onto the muddy beaches of South Asia, where thousands of small workers stand waiting, with only a 5,400 degree Fahrenheit cutting torch and wages of less than $4 a day. Here, these floating cities that once crossed the oceans are cut apart into pieces, each steel plate, each ship compartment, each pipeline, until they vanish as if they had never existed. More than 90% of a ship's materials can be recycled, but the price paid is a hazardous working environment. In this journey, join Mandarin Tech as we explore the place where every ship ends, the ship-breaking industry, the process of dismantling massive structures, and the lives of workers who are trading their own lives to rebirth steel for the world. To understand why massive ships must be scrapped, first look at the entire life cycle of the maritime shipping industry. At present, the global commercial fleet includes more than 100,000 vessels. Each year, around 2,700 new ships are built and launched, while 400 to 500 older ships are retired from service. A ship operates efficiently for about 25 to 30 years. After that point, maintenance costs rise rapidly. The steel hull gradually deteriorates due to saltwater corrosion. Cargo holds, machinery systems, engines, and even the hull structure can no longer maintain their original level of safety. In addition, global emission standards require ships to reduce sulfur content in fuel, making many older vessels legally obsolete. Beyond economic and technical factors, there are also sudden reasons that force a ship out of service. Collisions, groundings, fires, or severe mechanical failures. When repair costs exceed operational value, dismantling becomes the only option. And a crucial question emerges. Where do these ships go? Are they dismantled at sea in complex salvage operations involving cranes, robots, and structural simulations? Or are they towed straight onto land, heading for the beaches of South Asia, where labor is cheap, coastlines are wide, and demand for scrap steel is enormous? The reality is that when a ship reaches the end of its life cycle, its final destination is very likely to be one of the three most famous ship-breaking yards in the world. Along in India, Chittagong in Bangladesh, and Ghadani in Pakistan. Together, these sites account for nearly 70% of global shipbreaking activity. In Alang, hundreds of ships are driven directly onto a shoreline stretching about six miles each year, forming a massive open-air dismantling assembly line. Chittagong is known for its beaching method, forcing ships onto muddy shores using the full power of the tides. Gadani was once the fastest shipbreaking center in the world, though it came with significant risks. Despite their differences in scale and technique, all three share the same role, stripping apart tens of thousands of tons of steel and feeding it back into the global economy. Before a ship is dismantled, it must first be valued. The buyer, Typically, scrap steel traders or shipbreaking companies assesses the vessel based on two main factors, the amount of recoverable steel and the current market price of scrap steel. A typical cargo ship can generate between three and six million US dollars. Cruise ships are worth even more because they contain large quantities of non-ferrous metals, stainless steel, and expensive interior equipment. The purpose of ship dismantling generally falls into two categories breaking the ship for scrap and dismantling it for component reuse. Most of the steel, copper, aluminum, electrical cables, propellers, shafts, and machinery systems are recovered. Meanwhile, valuable components such as engines, navigation equipment, hydraulic pumps and generators are carefully removed, inspected, and resold to smaller vessels or local markets. In this way, before a ship is officially cut into sections, it has already completed its final economic role, becoming a source of raw materials and components for many different industries. After the final inspection and completion of the sail paperwork, the ship prepares to enter the last journey of its life. It is no longer capable of moving on its own, so a team of tugboats takes on the task of towing it into the scrapping yard. 
The critical moment always takes place during the few hours of high tide. The rising seawater lifts the massive hull, creating enough depth for the tugboats to control the direction and thrust, allowing the ship to slide deep onto the sandy beach. If the calculations are wrong, the ship can become stuck offshore or drift off course, creating major difficulties for the entire operation. But when everything goes according to plan, the ship moves onto the beach under its own momentum and comes to rest there. As the tide recedes, the hull settles firmly into the shoreline, exposing the enormous underside that has remained hidden beneath the water for decades. This is the moment that marks the transition. From a vehicle of transportation, it becomes a mass of material waiting to be dismantled. In the months that follow, hundreds of workers will move through every steel compartment, dissecting the ship from the inside out. The first stage is to completely empty the ship's compartments. Workers begin dismantling the interior, doors, tables, and chairs, lights, stainless steel railings, decorative panels, electrical wiring, and ventilation systems. Each item is inspected to determine whether it can be reused or resold. For cruise ships, this work is far more complex. Areas such as theaters, cinemas, gyms, swimming pools, bars, and hundreds of cabins must all be stripped manually. Many valuable components, such as industrial kitchens, sound systems, and air conditioning units, are removed intact and sold on the market. Once the interior layers are removed, the environmental handling team takes over. They pump out residual oil from the tanks, treat sludge, wastewater, and any chemicals remaining in pipelines and technical tanks. This is an extremely critical step. Even a small amount of flammable gas or uncollected oil can turn the flame of a cutting torch into an ignition source. After everything is cleaned, the ship is left with only an empty steel framework, ready for the heaviest stage, cutting the hull. Cutting the hull is the core task of the entire process. Workers erect scaffolding, mark the cutting lines, and begin using oxyacetylene cutting torches hotter than 3,000 degrees Celsius to pierce steel plates nearly three centimeters thick. Each completed cut separates a steel section weighing several tons, which is carefully rigged with cables before being dropped onto the sand by gravity. The sound of steel hitting the ground always echoes. Another part of the ship's body has been severed. Tractors then drag these large sections deeper into the yard to be cut into smaller pieces. Three teams of workers, steel cutters, transport crews, and cable recovery teams work continuously to recover as much material as possible. Depending on the size of the ship, this entire stage can last from several months to more than a year. Although the process may sound sequential, in reality, this work is extremely dangerous. Shipbreaking workers often work 12 to 16 hours a day, earning only about three to four US dollars. They face the risk of falling steel, slipping from heights, explosions caused by residual oil, or inhaling asbestos dust, a substance that can cause permanent lung damage. At many shipbreaking yards, protective equipment is scarce and access to medical care is limited. Since the late 1960s, nearly 2,000 serious accidents have been recorded, and the actual number may be much higher, as many migrant workers are not officially documented. Many international organizations have made efforts to improve working conditions, but change has been slow. Shipbreaking remains an industry that relies more on human labor than machinery, and that reality keeps the risk of accidents ever-present. Outside the shipbreaking yards, many workers live in makeshift housing, lacking clean water and basic sanitation. The physically demanding yet unstable nature of the work limits their access to education, insurance, and alternative livelihoods, forcing many to remain tied to a highly dangerous occupation for years. What has allowed this industry to exist for more than half a century is the enormous economic value of recycled steel. When a ship is cut apart piece by piece, every steel plate, every pipe section, and every structural frame becomes a resource. A medium-sized cargo ship can supply 10,000 to 25,000 tons of steel, while a large cruise ship can exceed 40,000 tons. All of this steel is sent to furnaces to be reborn, becoming billets, rebar, steel plates, 
and countless products used in construction, bridges, roads, and infrastructure. The environmental benefits of recycled steel are also significant. Recycling saves up to 70% of the energy compared to producing steel from ore, while also reducing CO2 emissions. Beyond steel, other metals, such as copper from electrical wiring, aluminum from railings, brass from propellers, and stainless steel from industrial kitchens, are recovered at high rates. These materials have long service lives and reusing them helps reduce pressure on natural resources. Even many mechanical components, such as compressors, generators, pumps, and navigation systems, are inspected and resold to local markets. From a ship that appears to have lost all value, the shipbreaking industry can generate millions of U.S. dollars in materials and equipment, allowing them to continue their journey in new projects. Shipbreaking is often described as a victory for recycling in the circular economy. Steel is recovered, resources are conserved, and global emissions are reduced. But the environment is not always saved. Sometimes it dies somewhere else. At shipbreaking yards, the price paid is no longer abstract numbers, but soil, water, air, and human lives. A single ship contains dozens of hazardous substances, asbestos in piping, lead-based paint on the hull, PCBs in electronic equipment, heavy metals, residual oil in tanks, and even biological waste from cruise ship sanitation systems. If not handled carefully, these substances can seep into the soil or flow into the sea, causing contamination that can last for decades. In many areas near shipbreaking yards, concentrations of heavy metals have been found to far exceed permitted levels. Fish and marine life decline sharply, land becomes degraded, and local residents face serious health problems. The beaching method, though cheap and widely used, causes significant environmental damage because the entire process takes place on open beaches without proper waste treatment systems. Because of such environmental impacts and safety risks, not every ship can simply be driven onto a beach for dismantling. Some types of vessels must be handled under special conditions with far stricter levels of control. Nuclear submarines are a clear example. They contain reactors, fuel rods, and radioactive cooling systems, all of which are extremely dangerous if dismantled improperly. Only the United States, Russia, and the United Kingdom have the capability to dismantle this type of vessel. A single submarine can take 10 to 15 years to be fully dismantled. Due to environmental and health risks, the world has begun to establish stricter regulations. The Hong Kong Convention of 2009 requires ship recycling to be carried out in a safe and environmentally sound manner, although it will not officially enter into force until 2025. In addition, the European Union has issued regulations requiring ships flying the EU flag to be dismantled only at approved facilities. Every ship carries with it a fragment of the ocean's memory. Years spent crossing waves, transporting goods, and carrying people to places they had never set foot before. But when that journey comes to an end, its steel does not disappear. On shipbreaking beaches stretching across South Asia, hundreds of workers work day and night, cutting apart massive steel plates and returning to the world materials that will continue to be used in bridges, factories, industrial zones, and sometimes even in a new ship. That life cycle, though filled with risk and controversy, remains a vital link in the global economy. It reminds us that the end of a machine is not a loss, but the beginning of another form, more durable and more silent. If you want to explore more engineering stories hidden behind the world's great structures, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to Mandarin Tech so you won't miss the journeys ahead.